Hi everyone, my name is Scott Shell. If you want to go ahead and check out my academic credentials, please go ahead and visit scottshell.net. Thank you. So for the last video, we went ahead and looked at the Proto-Germanic long vowels, and we saw how they were reflected in the various Germanic languages. Um, we saw, for example, that there were typologies and systems, um, basically these reasons why we would reconstruct as linguists um, these various words in the Proto-Germanic. Um, and of course, the goal was to show you that it's not guesswork. We're actually using data to come up with these ideas. So today I'll go ahead and just talk about the Proto-Germanic short vowels. Um, this one's actually going to be a little bit shorter than the long vowels, pun not intended. Um, but it's just because the short vowels are a little bit easier to talk about than the long vowels. Because, you know, in the long vowels you have E1 and E2, and that can get kind of messy and confusing for some people. So... Um, but today's video will be pretty straightforward. Uh, like usual, the reason that we're going through these things is to, just to show you that this is how linguists know that words are related, right? We look at data, we look at typologies, um, and then we come up with ideas for like how words should be reconstructed. So the first vowel we're going to go ahead and talk about is Proto-Germanic short E. Um, the word I have for you here on the screen is ethana or ethanon. Both are fine, it's just that the ethanon is an older form of that reconstruction. So we see here in Old English that the root vowel is an E, it's etan. Um, of course, we see in Old Saxon that it's also a short E, so etan again. Um, in Old Norse, we see eta. In Old High German, we see essen, um, which is exactly like modern high, uh, modern Hochdeutsch, modern High German. Um, so not much has changed there, but what we see in Gothic is itan, itan. So we see that this short E shifts to an I in Gothic. So, but is this enough data to call this some form of like typology? Well, obviously not, which is why I've provided you with some other words here to look at as well. Um, but I also want to be clear too, that the shift is happening in unconditioned environments. Um, I'll get into what that means in a later video, but you know, for now, just this sort of normal situation for it to shift in from a, a short E to a, a short I is just um, a regular occurrence without like the vowel occurring before like an R or an M or an N. So these sort of like conditioned environments. And so the next one we have here is Regan. Regan. This is just rain um, in modern English. Uh, we look at Old Saxon. We see that there is a root E there. Uh, it is either pronounced Reyan or Regan, depending on the dialect, essentially. Um, we see in Old High German that it's Regan. Oh, that was modern German. Regan in Old High German. Uh, we see that it was Rain in Old English, which sounds exactly like Rain, Rain, Rain. It's exactly like modern English Rain. Um, and so hopefully, you know, by looking at all, this, at all this data systematically, you're starting to sort of make sense as to how all these languages are related to, um, especially when you have a word like rain being, you know, modern rain today from Old English, not much has changed. Um, all right, so then, but but what we see now is Regen in Gothic, Regen. So you can see that the I has shifted upwards, right, from that, that E. Um, so again, we have two examples here of short E becoming short I um, in the Gothic language with uh, in, in unconditional environments. So then we'll go ahead and look at a third piece of evidence here. Um, this is legran. Leg, legran. This is a uh, layer. Essentially, it's, it's modern English layer. Um, and in fact, let's go ahead and look at the cognates, and you'll, you'll hear that pronunciation even in... Uh, Old English. So now we see here in Old Saxon uh, that the root E is present in Legar. You also see that in Old High German as Legar. Uh, you see it in Old Norse as Legar. Uh, but then you see um, in Old English Leyer. So it's actually the same vowel. It's just it's palatalized a little bit. It's L-E-G. Um, but that's essentially how you get modern English layer, right? So it was more like layer in Old English, but layer in American English. But then again, for Gothic, you know, you see that short I. And again, it's in an unconditioned environment. So what do we logically reconstruct here for this, this, well, really these three words, 
we're going to reconstruct um, a short E in the root rather than a short I because a short I is something that's specifically sort of happening to Gothic. So now let's go ahead and talk about Proto-Germanic short A. Uh, the word I've given you here is the Proto-Germanic reconstruction for the literal cognate acre. Um, it's akras. But of course, this can also be translated as um, field, right? So we see that it's used that way in, in multiple um, Germanic languages. So let's go ahead and look at the root short vowel in Old Saxon. We'll see that it's akr. We see Old High German akr. We see Old Norse akr. Um, we then see akr in Old English because Old English is the strange one here with the unconditional short vowels. They just end up sort of what we call fronting. Um, and then, of course, we have akr in Gothic. So in this case, Old English is going to be our strange example here where something specifically is happening to that language and not the other languages. So essentially, we're going to reconstruct this with a short A. So now we have the Proto-Germanic word father. So I'm giving you another example here with a short A. So again, you can see all this data. Um, Old Saxon has um, a short A, as in father. Uh, we have Old High German, Vater. We have Old Norse, father. And then we have Old English, Feather, feather. Um, let me say something about this real quick. So you might say, well, why do we say father now if we said fader then, like with a D? Um, there are two schools of thought. One is that we just simply borrowed this word from Old Norse. Um, as you can see, the Old Norse pronunciation right there is pretty much exactly like we would say it in modern English. Um, the other is that the older R sound in Old English influenced that D later uh, to become an ed sound. And that's called roticism. And lastly, of course, we have Gothic father. Father. Yeah, I did pronounce that as an ed, even though it's written as a D in Gothic, it is pronounced as an ed in between vowels. And let's go ahead with our third piece of uh, evidence here for short A and why we would reconstruct a short A into a given word. Dagas. Dagas. A lot of people are actually very familiar with that word because that's even um, a rune name, right? But well, now here's a you know good opportunity for you to understand why we would reconstruct that rune name the way that we do. So in Old Saxon, we see that the root vowel is an A, a short A. So we have dach. We see that the root A has shifted to an ash sound in Old English, which is expected. So we see day, day, which sounds like day, right? I mean, so it's very close. Uh, we see Old Norse with dag, so we see that short A again. Uh, and then in Old High German, we have tach, well, really more like tak, tak. Um, my pronunciation is very much influenced by like Nita Zexish, like Lower Saxony High German. So, uh, yeah, so it's technically tuck, not tuck. And then finally, we have Gothic dogs, dogs. So again, short A across the board. Um, Old English is the odd one with the sort of systematic shift and the systematic fronting of this uh, short A sound to the front of the mouth. So of course, we're going to reconstruct it as dogs rather than something else. All right. And so the next one is going to be short U. Uh, this one's very simple. It pretty much just continues into the Germanic languages. It's just straight short U. Uh, the word I've provided to you here is the word son, S-O-N, and it is pronounced sunus, sunus, right? Not sunus, but sunus. So let's look, like, let's go ahead and look at the Germanic data again, though. Like, how do we reconstruct this, this uh, root U, this short root U? Well, Old Saxon, sunu. Old English, Sunu, Old High German, Sunu, Old Norse, Sunur, and then we have Gothic, Sunus. So, pretty uh, self explanatory. We just reconstruct that short U because that's what the data is across the board for this word. Let's go ahead and look at two more examples um, just so, again, we can kind of prove our point here. Um, this word I'm providing to you here is. Dumas, dumb, dumbas, dumb dumbass, dumbas. There we go. <laughs> All right. So Old Saxon, uh, dumb 
Old English dumm, um, Old Norse dummer, and then we have um, Gothic dumms, and then we have um, Old High German tum. So you can see how all of those words for dumb, as in the short U, is going to be reconstructed into Proto Germanic. So, and also congratulations, you can now officially tell people that they are a dumbass in six different languages. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about a fun one. Um, this one's Suno. Suno, not Suno. Maybe some of you already know where I'm going with uh, regarding this pronunciation. Um, but let's look at Old Saxon. Suno. Sana. You actually have two forms there. You have a masculine form and a feminine form. But the masculine form is later, and it was probably just influenced by Christianity. And then you have Old English, Sana. You have... Old High German Sunna, you have Old Norse Sunna, and then you finally have Gothic Sunno. So in Old High German, people might say, What? I thought that the name of the goddess was Suna, right? In the Old High German Merseburg terms. It's actually not pronounced Suna. I mean, we all sort of say it that way because we're accustomed to it, but technically the pronunciation of her name is Sunna. So again, you can see the short U's right there, um, all in the roots. So of course, we are going to reconstruct this word with a short U in the Proto-Germanic language. All right, now we have our last vowel. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and talk about Proto-Germanic short I. Uh, the word I've provided to you here is fish. It's just simply fiskas in Proto-Germanic. Uh, it's a very common example. Uh, if we look at the root vowel though, again, in these other various languages, we can see why we reconstruct this again with a short I. So Old Saxon, fisk, Old High German, fisk, Old English, fish, actually. So kind of interesting that the word fish for us uh, English speakers has not really changed much since Old English. And then finally, we have Old Norse fisker and Gothic fisks. So again, short I in, in the root position. We go ahead and reconstruct that short I, of course, into Proto-Germanic. Pretty simple. Now for another example, I mean, again, because we like our data, uh, list is list is in Proto-Germanic. That means like crafty. In German, they say listig, right? Listig. That's uh, still used today. But again, how do we reconstruct this in Proto-Germanic? Well, look at the data once once again. Um, we'll see that Old English had the word list. Old Saxon had the word list. Old Norse had the word list across the board, right? And then finally, we get over to Gothic, and it's just lists, right? Lists. All right, now for another fun one. Um, another example here for short I. Proto-Germanic wikon. Wikon. This is weak. It's literally weak. But in Proto-Germanic times, it probably just meant more of a, something that was like a sequence. Uh, we see like in Old Norse, for example, that it eventually means like nautical mile. Um, and of course, the their Germanic people uh, did not have um, a week as we think about it today. Um, they didn't have seven days. That was, that was a later Roman thing. Um, originally they had five days and this five day quote unquote week, um, was really something that was called a fimt, um, in Icelandic or old Norse. So we, we do know that, you know, the original weekday was actually five days, not seven days, but whatever. The whole point I'm trying to say is that the proto-Germanic word for week here did not mean week. It just meant a sequence or a turning point. Anyway, so let's go ahead and look at the data. Old Saxon, Wicca. Old English, Wicku. Old Norse, Wicca. And then finally, Gothic, Wicku. And so logically, what do we do? We reconstruct that short I into the word for weak in Proto-Germanic. Um, some people might say, well, why do we say weak now? You know, shouldn't that be like weako or something like that? And that's actually not the case. Um, that's something called compensatory lengthening. And I'll talk about it in that that video where I'm going to talk about the various weird things like umlaut and, um, well, I umlaut, you umlaut, so-called W umlaut, and so on and so forth, oblaut. Um, and then I'll talk about why something like that happens. Um, but essentially, um, it becomes a long I later in modern English. But anyway, it's a short I in Proto-Germanic. So that's all I have for you guys today. I just wanted to go ahead and show you again how words are related through uh, the Proto-Germanic short vowels going into the other various Germanic languages. So again, I did not cover anything um, 
like I umlaut or U umlaut or W umlaut or compensatory lengthening um, or any other conditions, you know, that change these vowels um, because they get like colored or something. Um, these are just straight vowels from Proto-Germanic into unconditioned environments into the various Germanic languages. So if you got that and you're, you're getting the basics down, you're, you know, you're on the right path. We're going to go ahead and do some diphthongs next, and then I'm going to go ahead and talk about all these weird, um, not necessarily complicated, but somewhat nuanced phonological processes. Take care, everyone, and I hope you have a great weekend.